If you're able to stand, please stand with me while we read uh, Psalms 100. Starting verses 1 through 10. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. God, Heavenly Father, Father, we are here today to praise you, to glorify you, to worship you, Father. Father, let us feel your spirit here with us. Fill us, overflow us with, with the Holy Spirit. And we can listen to the message today that the words today, the message today will touch our hearts. Draw us closer to you. Well, we just want to just praise your name. This praise and worship just come out of our lips, out of our mouth. Please open our ears, our heart, our mind to this message today. Have us to lift all our cares and worries to leave you. As we devote this time to you, the love we have for you, the compassion we have for you, here to glorify you and to praise you. I lift this prayer to you, Father. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, because of the season we are in, it's a time of year where we begin to focus on our relationships, to, fo to focus on our family, to focus on those relationships, the long-term relationships that we have with our friends, with our family. See, it's a time of year where we, we begin to send out cards to one another, cards of thanks to show our friends, our family, how much we love them. It's a time of year where we start to share. We start to buy gifts. We start for others. Out of the love we have for them. See, it's a time of year where we, be, we become cog, cog, cognizant of how much we really have been blessed. It's a time of year where we realize that we have so much to thank the Lord for. Mainly for his eternal, eternal inheritance. That gift of eternal life that is waiting for us in heaven. But you see, it's, it's the time of year that all this now comes into focus. The time of year where now we, we pay more attention to how we have been blessed. We pay more attention to our relationships and how close people are how much they mean to us. And so we have now entered this time of year. We have now entered this season. We have all been blessed and we all have so many reasons to praise the Lord. But despite our many blessings, despite we have so many things to be thankful for, every now and then we will find ourselves having a pity party. Have any of you ever had a pity party? Don't raise your hand now. <laughs> yeah, pity party you usually see it's a party of one. A pity party usually is where well, there's no cake, there's no balloons, <laughs> there's no happy faces, there's one sad face, and it usually is ours. Okay. But every once in a while, see, even though we have so much to be thankful for. Or to praise the Lord for every once in a while we find ourselves having a pity party. 
We usually have our pity party at a time when our lives seem to be turned upside down, where nothing seems to be going right in our life. Nothing seems to be going our way. Our life seems to be falling apart. Okay? At a time when everything, at a time when we think when things can't possibly get any worse, and sure enough, they do. This is when we say to ourselves, or we say to God, why, why me, Lord? Why me? Thankfully, our pity parties are few and far between. As I was thinking about this COVID-19 pandemic that we're experiencing now, and how it has reaped havoc in the lives of so many, and how it has affected everyone's lives in one way or another. At a time where I, I was thinking about this, of all the people not to have a pity party, I was thinking about those who are on the front lines of the pandemic. Your doctors and nurses who are exposed to death and dying on a daily basis. I have a feeling they have a greater appreciation for the things they have, and great appreciation for life, they probably have more than the average person. And as they leave the hospital each day after having a hectic day, and when they get home, I bet it, it's a constant reminder every day of the many things, they, reasons they had to be thankful for, the many things that they have to be thankful for. Thankful for the things that the average person just simply takes for granted. I bet it's the most important thing in their life is their family. I bet it's their friends. It's, it's their kids. It's their loved ones. And no doubt they have a great appreciation for life itself. Never to be taken for granted. I can't imagine them ever getting upset or complaining over little or nothing because everything would seem so trivial in respects to life and death situation that they are exposed to, that they experience on a daily basis. You know, it's unfortunate, but so often it takes our witnessing a tragedy, our, our being part of one, before we really realize how blessed we really are. Or it seems that we don't have a great, a great appreciation for the things we have until we see the needs of someone else are so much greater than our own. Then it causes us to stop and look at our own life and look at the things that we have been blessed with. But it's unfortunate, but it's true. You see, that's what it takes before we really Realize how blessed we have and how much thanks we should be giving the Lord. I once read a quote many years ago, and it said this I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Because there will always be someone somewhere who is having it much, much worse than ourselves. It is annoying this that should keep us humble and cause us to always show gratitude and thankfulness for the things that we do have. See, we must be mindful of the fact that all the things that we do have see, was provided for us by God. And without his blessing on our lives, our lives would be so much worse than they are today. See, it is for this reason that we, that we worship God and that, that we praise him. Try to imagine this. Try to imagine how Jesus must have felt. Seeing so many people suffering needlessly and helplessly, and so often it was a result, a result of their own doing. See, it was because of his love for them, because of his compassion for them, that everybody was 
brought before them. See, he healed them. Healed them of their suffering. Healed them of their pain. And as many of them openly praised him, expressing their gratitude and their how grateful they were. In Psalms 100, verse, if you turn your Bible to Psalms 100, or keep it there if you're still there. Verse 1 says, Shout for joy to the Lord of the earth. See, as we look at the works of his hands, his awesome creation, and how wonderful everything thing is made, it gives all the earth reason to shout for joy. See, his creation is a testimony of his power. It's a testimony of his awesomeness and his wisdom. And that's what scripture says. The heavens he created is for him, but it also tells us that he gave the earth, or he created the earth for man. See, it is when we take in consideration his love, his grace and his mercy it is when we take in consideration all the good things that he has done in our own personal lives. See, we have reason now for sharp to shout for joy. And when we take in consideration his faithfulness and we take in consideration the many blessings that he has waiting for all those who love him. And the only way we can express our thankfulness there again is like the psalm says, is to shout. For joy. Just think about this for a moment. As children of God, we have been blessed more than any of God's creation. We have more reason to shout for joy of our outward expression of our appreciation of what God has done for us than all his creation. And this includes the heavenly hosts. Psalms, verse 2, look at verse 2. It says, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Our worshiping the Lord with gladness shows him how thankful we are for all the good things that he has done in our lives. Okay? And so we express it by worshiping him in gladness. You know, while the majority of people in the world believe there is a God, so many of them do not know him. Okay? They are lacking in knowledge of him. They are lacking in appreciation for what he's doing in their lives. As far as they're concerned, he's not involved in their life. They believe that everything that they, they have accomplished in their life is because of their own doing. They see no reason at all to give someone else thanks for what they have done and especially some God that they do not know. Have you ever stopped to imagine what would your life be like now if you didn't know God? What if you had never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? What would your life be right now? What path would you be on? Knowing at one time you were on a path that was alienating you from God. What would your life be like today? Where would you be right now? What would you be doing if you didn't know God? If you had never accepted Jesus? See, it's memories of our life when we didn't know God. It's memories of a life that we were living where we had no hope. It's these memories of a life that we had that was totally alienating us from God in comparison to the life that we have now. A life with a living hope. A, a life with eternal blessing waiting for us in the heaven. It's in comparison to the the life we had then and the life that we have now that we worship the Lord in gladness because we have so much to be glad about, to be appreciative about. Our worshiping the Lord with gladness starts with humility. Having humility. 
something. We must be at a place in our life where we are humble. Humble enough to realize that. Everything we have comes from God. Humble enough to accept the fact that all that he has done in our life and we're nothing without him. It is humility that creates in us an attitude of gratefulness. And it's this attitude of gratefulness that we have that now leads us into one to worship him. Gladness. But it all starts with being humble. As verse 2 says, also says, it says, come before him with joyful songs. A major part of our worship of the Lord is done through singing joyful songs. Have you ever noticed that when you worship the Lord with joyful song, it changes your mood? Just like this morning, it changes your mood. It changes your frame of mind. It creates in you. It creates in you a desire to want to worship the Lord with raised hands, that many of you do. But see, this is when you're singing or worshiping the Lord with joyful songs. It causes us to put our cares and worries aside. It changes our mood, our frame of mind. We just want to raise our hands as we worship him. See, when the singing of song of the Lord, our, our cares, our worries. They completely leave. Our mind focuses on the goodness of God and his many blessings upon us. And this is why we have the praise team. Lead us in songs of worship and praise before the sermon message and after the sermon message. See, it's very important because they put us in this frame of mind of wanting to worship the Lord and want to praise him. Verse 3, look at Psalms, verse 3. It says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pastor. If we look at the first six words, words here, know that the Lord is God. It is obvious that this this is a statement of fact. The Lord is God. And we are his creation. See, and we must humble ourselves and accept the fact that he is God. He made us according to his, his own will, his own purposes. And we are his. And knowing this, see, it should... We should be endeavor to seek out his purpose for our life so we can live our life that is pleasing to him. It's very common that when we become born again, that we view it as God joining us. When we become born again, we view it as, well, God is now with me. God is now alongside of me. We view, we view it as God is now joining us. Now, while this may be true, in reality, he didn't join us. In reality, we joined him through our baptism. We became part of his kingdom. We became a citizen of heaven. He adopted us into his family. We became part of the family of God, as Jesus pointed out. Jesus pointed this out in in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. He said, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution, and in this, the age to come, eternal life. See, what Jesus is saying here, that if we put him first in our life, 
and everyone else second. He said, then and only then do you, be, do you become part of the family of God. And when he says here that in this life, okay, you'll have more mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers because now, even in this life, we become one family. We treat each other as family. We love each other as family. And Jesus said, and even in the age to come, eternal life. Verse 3 says, we become his people, a sheep of his pasture. We were not created to be independent of God, but to accept him as our shepherd, to have him lead us into the type of life that he wants us to live. Surely God didn't create us in his image and likeness and not wanting us to live a life that was pleasing to him. Surely he didn't want to create us without giving us a guideline as how to live our life. Surely he wouldn't do that. That's why he gave us the Bible. Verse 4 of Psalms. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You see, enter the gates and his courts with thanksgiving. The psalmist here is making reference to coming into the presence of God. And the presence he's specifically speaking of, to come into the presence of God through prayer. And when we come before his throne, one of the reasons in part should be for thankfulness. We should never run out of reasons to thank the, the Lord for his many blessings whenever we come into his presence. And verse 4 says, give thanks to him and praise his name. You see, this is not a suggestion. This is it's a command. A few reasons why we are commanded to give thanks to the Lord is that it keeps us humble and aware of our dependency on God. You understand that? Let me say that again. We are commanded to give him thanks. It keeps us humble and aware of our dependency on God. It keeps us from having the attitude of, look, I, look what I have done. Because we realize everything came from God. It keeps us in a right relationship with him. It keeps thoughts of sin and temptation and selfishness out of our mind. It makes it possible for us to maintain a good perspective on life. And this is why we are commanded to do this. It's not a suggestion. We are commanded to give thanks to the Lord. Jesus set an example for us. And that we should give thanks for everything. Jesus was constantly in prayer to the Father, giving thanks for all things. He set an example for us that through prayer, we should praise him and give thanks for all things. When we praise his name, it shows our appreciation for all that he has done in our lives. It also is a sign that we are not taking what he has given us for granted. Let me use an example of the story of the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men we had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, 
they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? See, the others were Jews. The Samaritan was considered a foreigner. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Only one of the ten came back to praise Jesus for his healing. Only one. See, this is important to know. There's a reason why Jesus pointed this out, that only one came back. It's a reason why he pointed it out that the person that came back, see, was a Samaritan and not a Jew. He said, this, so Samaritans were looked down upon by the Jews. Samaritans were, in general, very proud people. They looked down upon the Jews, uh, the Samaritan, as a half-breed. But this Samaritan, see, he was humble. He had a humble attitude. Just like the Samaritan in the, in the story of the Good Samaritan. He had a humble attitude. And he came back to praise Jesus. He threw himself at his feet and to praise him, to thank him. Or his healing. He went back to give praise to Jesus. But why didn't the other nine? Why didn't they praise him? Why didn't they thank him? What would be the attitude of anyone who will not take the time to thank God and to praise him for his many blessings? What would be the attitude of such a person to do this? Would it be one of pride? Would it be one of lacking of appreciation of what God has done for them? Would it be that taking his blessings for granted? Or that Jesus is simply not that important in their life? As to see the need to thank him? Do you think about it? That's why Jesus brought this point out. Only one came back. What about these other nine? Were they taking it for granted the healing that Jesus healed them? Do we take for granted the blessings that God blesses us with? Do we take the time to thank him? Do we take the time to praise him? Or do we take for granted? Or is it pride? Or, or is the fact that Jesus is not that important to me in my life that I see a need to thank him for the things that I have? He's not that important that I see a need to thank him for my meal each day, every time I meal. For my job, for the money I have to pay my bills, for the shelter. Is it just not that important to you to see the need? See, this is why... We, a little bit earlier, I, I said we're commanded to give and pray because it keeps us humble. It keeps us aware of the fact that all that we have came from God. It comes from God. It shows us that we're dependent on him. It keeps from having that attitude of, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Does this racial see apply today? that only one out of ten people will actually take the time to give thanks and praise the Lord for their blessing. Only one. The question is, why? what about the other nine? Why not? You see, Jesus must be the most important person in our life, and there absolutely there is no exception. There should not be a minute of our day that goes by without us thinking about him. I say that because I say it because every word or every thought or every deed should constantly be weighed against the, the premise 
is what I'm doing pleasing to God. Every thought, word, and deed, it should always be weighed against that. It's what I'm doing pleasing to God. Paul brings this to our attention to Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God, the Father through him. All that we do, all the same, word be our thoughts. It all should be done, giving thanks. Done in the name of the Lord Jesus. If we ask ourselves this one crucial question, in, in all that we do, is it in the name of the Lord? That one crucial question. If we ask ourselves that, is it in the name of the Lord? This will go a long way in, in preventing us from sinning. And when we do sin, we will readily repent and ask for forgiveness. Because it will keep us humble. Verse 5. The last verse says, For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. See, this verse here highlights three of the attributes of the Lord. It highlights his goodness, his love, and his faithfulness. And as Jesus once said, only God is good, meaning only God is perfect. Psalms 116.12 says, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? Psalms 23, 6. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 145, 7. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. You see, God is abundant in goodness. And we should celebrate his goodness and we should joyfully sing of his righteousness in our hearts. There's so many psalms here, just, just a few, that emphasize the goodness of God, the righteousness of God, and reasons why we should always be praising God. Verse 5 also makes mention of God's love as enduring. And this is so true because this is very essence, the very nature of God is love. So his love will endure forever because God is love. The Apostle Paul had a very close and intimate relationship with the Lord. And it's because of this reason, he said what he did at Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Lord. See what Paul is saying here? He realizes because of that close, intimate relationship that he had with the Lord. He realized that there's absolutely nothing in all of creation, seen or unseen, that will ever separate us from the love of God. And that love is seen through Jesus Christ. God's only begotten son that died for our sins on the cross. That was God demonstrating his love for us through Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is saying here. Romans 5, 5 says it. God loved 
God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured into our hearts now by the Holy Spirit. The only way you can receive God's love is through the Holy Spirit. But it's been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. See, without having God's love, it will absolutely impossible for us to keep the commandments, the two commandments, to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. It would be impossible. It would be impossible for us to keep the command to love our neighbor as ourselves. Without this love of God in us, poured in us by the Holy Spirit, we would only have a love for ourselves, no one else. Verse 5 ends with his faithfulness continues to all generations. God's faithfulness is said to last a thousand generations. In other words, what it is saying that there's absolutely no end to God's faithfulness. And it's for this reason and we, we have a reason to rejoice and to praise him. Because there is no God like our God. Amen? Amen? See, if you truly grasp the awesomeness of God and how loving he is, how kind he is, how faithful he is, you see, this will humble you. And you will ask yourself the same question asked by the psalmist. At Psalm 8, 4. I don't have a PowerPoint. The psalmist asks this question. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. If you truly grasp the awesomeness of God, you would ask yourself, why does he care so much about us? Why does he love us so much? He sacrificed his only begotten son for us. That is truly awesome. Amen. Let's bow our heads. God of Heavenly Father.